you like FPS games? I do. TF2, Apex Legends, Diabolical, Overwatch. I've played and loved all these games, but when it comes to the gameplay, none of them stand a chance compared to Ultra Kill. For a game in early access, it's already left a huge influence on the genre. In this video, I'm going to go over Act 1 and talk about why Ultra Kill does FPS games right. Spoilers ahead. When you boot up the game, you're following through what looks like some sort of empty elevator shaft while the fire is gone plays on loop. Click play, select your difficulty, and the game puts you through their boot up sequence. At the end, you're told the very basics. You are V1. You're going to hell. You need a weapon. Mankind is dead, blood is fuel, and hell is full. Before you even have any guns, you have your arms. You have the Feedbacker, a punch that has the unique mechanic of being able to parry projectiles and attacks back into enemies. And later on you acquire the Knuckle Blaster. This thing is strength incarnated as a weapon. It does more damage, it has more knockback, and if you hold down the punch button after swinging your arm... While it can't parry, the ability to just clear out small enemies with a shockwave still makes it a fun choice. And the fact that you reload your arm after every shockwave is so amusing to me, I can't help but smile when I see it. The first gun you're given is a basic revolver. It's got a quick regular shot, and you can hold down the right click to charge up a piercing shot. It'll go through some of the weaker mobs and hit multiple times when you shoot it at the bigger enemies in the game. The charge shot has a cooldown as indicated by this battery showcased on it, but in my opinion, the real fun with this gun comes when you swap out the battery for four little coins. The Marksman Revolver is fucking amazing. All because of its alt fire. If you right click, you toss out a golden coin and you can then shoot it while it's in the air and it'll split off and go for the weak point of an enemy. And this is a massive oversimplification of the mechanics to this tiny piece of economy. Like seriously, Herb Messiah can make an 18 and a half minute long video about just this coin. If you want to learn more about how it works, check it out. The revolver also has an alternate side grade. The slab revolver always brings to mind a few things. It's slow, it's bulky, and it's beefy as hell. It's not better or worse than a regular revolver, it does more damage, it takes longer to shoot, and its marksman's coins will penetrate instead of splitting into other targets. It's quite literally the perfect side grade. The shotgun on Ultra Kill is, at the surface, pretty standard. It's great at close range, it'll pierce the weaker enemies like Filth and Stray, and it'll do great damage to the bigger enemies. But, something that you can do is to hold right click to charge up the core, and launch it out. Ultra Kill basically says, shotgun, grenade launcher, shotgun grenade launcher. The core can also be shot after it was launched to make the explosion even bigger. Not only that, but after you buy the pump variant of the shotgun, you can also quick swap between them to ramp up the damage output. Also, remember how I said that the feedbacker can parry projectiles? Well, the bullets in the shotgun are classified as projectiles. This quite literally means V1 is punching their bullets faster than they can come out of the gun, and it is so perfect for the aesthetic and just pure fun that Ultra Kill focuses on. I am heavy weapons guy. Okay, but for real, this gun isn't a gun, it's a walking OSHA violation. It's the only weapon to have an ammo system in the game. You have a hundred nails, and once they're out, you gotta wait until they come back. The 12 seconds that it takes to fill all the way back up may seem like a lot, but the nail gun reloads while it's in your back pocket, so you can still use the other weapons while waiting. But the best part of this gun comes when you start using the alt fire. Right clicking with the nail gun shoots out a magnet that pulls your nails towards it while still doing damage to enemies. It'll stick to the ground or other enemies if you can hit them with it, making it a really good tool for taking out the fodder enemies. 
The nail gun has one alternative form, the saw blade launcher. Trading out the nails for larger saws that although fire slower, ricochet around the room to continuously deal damage to the enemies around you. They also react to the magnets differently. While the nails spin around all chaotically, the saws will spin around in a circle around the magnet. So even though the center won't have any damage, the saws can cover a bigger area than the nails can. And both of these variations have an overheat version. You lose out on the magnet, but by shooting the gun, you'll build up a meter that, while it's filled, you can right click to... If you use the saw blade variant instead of vomiting nails on the enemy, you get to shoot out a giant flaming saw that also burns any enemies it passes through. The next gun is the fourth and final one you get in Act 1. It's a hitscan shot that does incredibly high damage and pierces through all enemies hit. And this is your introduction. And that was the Rail Cannon. And it's easy to draw comparisons between it and the BFG from Doom, but its functionality is different enough to make it feel completely different to play with. One singular shot is all you get before it goes on cooldown, but the damage alone is enough to make up for that. But it's also the only other weapon in the game that's able to also shoot the coins, which lets you rack up some pretty crazy damage if you place the coins just right. There are two other variants in the game right now, Malicious and Screwdriver. The Malicious variant causes an explosion at the end, and for some fun movement, you can combine it with a shotgun cord to send yourself flying. The Screwdriver causes enemies to constantly bleed everywhere to basically turn them into a health fountain. It's useful, but it's really not as fun as the huge amount of burst damage from the other two options. Okay, but why did I just spend so long talking about guns? Like, cool, they're in every other first person shooter too, it's kind of in the name. The reason is because I love the way they all interact with each other. You can use the knuckle blaster to push coins and cores into the stratosphere. And coins will always bounce to other coins first, as long as they have line of sight with each other. Which means you can just smite enemies from the sky. And the feedbacker can punch coins into enemies, and you can juggle the coins to do more and more damage. You want to style on an enemy by using the knuckle blaster to send them to space, then blow them up with coins? Go for it! There's so much potential for creative use of the weapons, that it's on you, the player, to make each encounter feel truly unique. Although I don't want to go over each and every single level because I tried that once before and that script ended up being over 6,000 words long, I do want to highlight some of my favorite things about each layer. The parts where you can see Sword Machine running through their own rooms alongside you is such an amazing setup to a future enemy, as well as Prelude in general being a very competent tutorial. Limbo shows just how much Hakita likes to subvert expectations by contrasting the fiery and mechanical factory you just went through in Prelude with a green and lush serene landscape. And something I want to quickly mention is the drone, who are introduced in this level and they're one of my favorite smaller enemies in the game because when they die, they try to fly themselves into you and they'll explode when they contact. The counterplay to this is to parry the drone back into any other demon you see. There are a few things that I love about Lust. For example, the moment you're introduced to the actual level is magnificent. The drawn out note along with the very sudden vibrant colors do so much to overwhelm you with a shock to your system. And the second thing to point out is this guy. But not his design, no, the thing I love about him is that in the first level, you're almost on equal level to him, and you're looking down at the same cityscape that he is, but then in the second level, you're suddenly beneath him in the very city that you used to be looking down on. It helps to connect the level so succinctly. You can imagine where you are in Lust, even though you really have no idea where it is other than this is like a city. And finally, Gluttony. And while I think the design makes sense for establishing a surreal feeling, the part I love the most is the build up to the final boss in this layer. Machine, turn back now.
The first actual voice you've heard all game, and it's Gabriel, voiced by Gianni Matragrano. The game has been subtly building him up throughout the levels in the background. He's a divine figure that serves justice, and the performance really sells it. And he also gives one of the best lines in all of gaming. What? How can this be? Best by this... this thing? You insignificant... The bosses in Ultra Kill are some of the best I've ever had the fortune to experience. Each encounter brings a level of intrigue with their buildup and are followed by an amazing fight. This fight takes place on the third level of Prelude and is my personal favorite out of the intro. The previous levels have introduced you to Swords Machine and this is where you finally confront him. And this guy is just pure fun. And also, probably the first roadblock for someone who's playing the game for the first time. Swords Machine is fast, faster than any enemy encountered in this entire layer. He's got access to range with his shotgun, fast approaching moves with his sword, and tons of damage to boot. If you're not careful, you'll die within seconds of a single mistake. But one of his main weaknesses is the parry mechanic. A well-timed attack will stun him and enrage him. Risk and reward for letting you get some free shots into him. After defeating him, you're rewarded with the shotgun before facing him again in his second phase where he uses new tricks with his sword. The same parry trick can work here though, and you'll be on your way soon enough. The final level of Limbo slows down before you're introduced to the boss. It's just a quiet night sky with Claire de Lune playing in the background. With the previous levels being chock full of action, it's a refreshing change of pace. You gotta collect 3 blue skulls, or 4, if you want to see Hank. V2, a red version of V1 with a new pair of hands custom built for your beating. V2 has all the same tools you do up until this point. They can move just like you, being able to wall jump, slide, and dash. Equipped with their own revolver and shotgun, on your first encounter, you better expect to restart over and over and over again until finally you finish it. The climax of Lust starts out slow, just like Claire de Lune, but it also leaves an underlying unnerving tone. The dark tunnel is progressed by placing a blue and red skull down, with a single encounter in between. The hand has only three attacks, each of them creates these shockwaves that can take up at least a third of the space you have to play in. But after you finish the hand encounter, you move on to the real boss fight. I'm being serious when I say this is my favorite colossal boss fight ever. Every attack is slow, but it hurts like hell if it connects. Minas also spawns this black hole that does 10 damage and 99 hard damage, so it might not outright kill you, but the second it touches you, the next hit it takes will finish you off. Phase 2 of the fight, Minos' eyes pop open, and each eye can shoot out either a volley of projectiles or a homing projectile. Now you have your whole arsenal at this point, and everything has its purpose. Each gun can reach him and deal the damage needed, but what about your parry? No, you're not crazy, and yes, that was real. The giant fists of this brute can be hit back into him to deal insane amounts of damage. The absolute perfect way to keep the power fantasy rolling while fighting a boss hundreds of times your size.
The final boss of Act 1 is that very angelic figure that I referenced before. And as I said, he's voiced by the ever gracious ship poster Gianni Matrograno. His monologue here is amazing at painting this pretentious, confident warrior that doesn't see you as anything more than pieces of metal. Once you enter the arena, his entrance is just as bright as the light he tries to represent. Gabriel's fight is just hard. He's constantly teleporting, making it difficult to keep track of him. If you want to try and parry him, good luck trying to find him first. The only chance you get to really let all out on him is after you deplete his first health bar, where he's put into a free fall and you can use your weapons to keep knocking him back up to extend how long he's stunned for. Afterwards, I'd say God help your soul, but I'm pretty sure God is on Gabriel's side here. Enough! Ultra Kill also has extra content that isn't really focused around explosions, blood, and combat. Each layer of Ultra Kill has a secret level to go alongside them, and they're usually all references to games of different genres. Prelude's level is an homage to the horror genre. Armed with nothing but the regular pistol, you're placed in a claustrophobic dark maze and you can barely see anything in front of you. The goal is to take the skulls and move them to their color-coordinated pedestal. Just know that somewhere down here, you're not alone. Limbo's secret level is a reference to not only puzzle games, but very specifically, The Witness. The one designed by Jonathan Blow and developed by Thecla Incorporated. A game where you can spend a whole hour watching a video just to complete a single line. And even though you won't find any puzzles that go around the whole island, Ultra Kill's puzzles are still challenging and enjoyable to complete. Let me preface this that the dialogue from Mirage in this level was influenced by Hakita's own personal experiences. The conversation here is beautiful and everybody who worked on it should be proud of themselves. Lust's secret level is a reference to the visual novel genre, initially feeling like a satirical take on visual novels, especially ones that take the dark tonal twist. But Ultra Kill contradicts the tone with a glimmer of hope. After you meet Mirage and strike up a conversation with her, slowly you begin to understand how much the world weighs on her, how her mind is in conflict. Eventually, they're going to die, and nothing will be left behind. Humanity, in the grand scheme of things, has been, and always will be, inconsequential. As the anxiety weighs heavier on Mirage, her world loses color. The borders of our screen begin to push inwards, and everything feels more claustrophobic. She comes to the conclusion that nihilism is the only way to face the inevitable end. She's cursed with the intelligence to be aware of our mortality, and that we're not special. We're as insignificant to the universe as ants are to us. So she chooses to not care. To not try. She chooses to disconnect herself. And even after her bombardment of reasons to not care, to give up, the only response we have is to tell her, you're wrong. Even though it's true that what we do is ultimately meaningless in the universe, it's because we have no meaning that we are left to define our own reasons for being alive and our own meaning. We're not cursed to waste our time because there's no better way to spend our time other to live. It's okay to fear the nothingness after we're dead, but to shut down our emotions isn't worth it. Love, empathy, and passion can override the dark thoughts and help them step to the side and make way for appreciation of life. It is not an easy job. It is not a quick job. It will sometimes feel like an impossible job. However, it can be done. With an immense amount of time, effort, and energy, it will improve. You can change. You can heal. And during the hardest times when all seems lost and you want to give up, never forget. We will always love you. Thank you, Hakita. Look. At the end of the day, doing FPS games right doesn't actually matter. What matters is that the game is enjoyable and leaves a lasting impression on you. And that's what Ultra Kill is to me. 
The gameplay is insanely fun, tons of depth to explore and ways to improve. The levels are chock full of details for all kinds of players. Whether you're someone who gets invested in the lore, or someone who wants to push the game to its boundaries and complete it as fast as possible, you can find enjoyment from Ultra Kill. And for me, it's the guns, the details in the levels, the bosses and secrets, they sell the game to me. They're the reasons that I am in love with the game and I hope that this video has expressed that passion. So if you want to go out and try the game, be my guest. There is so much more that I haven't talked about for you to find. And thank you, thank you for watching. Hey, thanks again for watching the video. There's no more content on Ultra Kill from here onward. This is just an addendum to get a few things out there. First off, I am going to credit as much as I can in the document in the description. There are many talented people out there, and I never want to take the credit away from any of them. Secondly, I want to talk about that Open Fortress video, because um, I was just blown away by the response. I only had a few subscribers that were just my close friends, and then after uploading it, suddenly over 650 of you people decided to tag along as well. And the viewership, I mean, I didn't think it would do that well. I was thinking maybe if I was being generous to myself, I'd give myself a thousand views, but it got over 30,000 in the first month, which is, wow. Thank you to everyone who has seen it and will ever see it. Third, this is a few things about the process that this video went through. It's been in the works for a little bit over four months now. I started writing this right after I uploaded the first video and the script went through 11 different revisions while I was editing and recording. It was definitely much more ambitious than my previous video, but I still think it was a quality video at the end of the day. And that's it really, I don't have much else to say, I'm happy making these videos and I'm enjoying myself while I'm editing these passion projects. So I hope you all have wonderful holidays and I cannot wait to show you guys what else I'll come up with. Bye.